We just had an interview with a person who has made it well into fluency, is moving on to mastery, and it is kind of exciting to talk to somebody who's made it. What's up, guys, and welcome back to Why War Friends English. We are really excited to share this video with you guys. It's a little bit different format. It's a little bit longer, but it's really good for you guys to be able to see a real example of somebody that has made it to fluency, and he's just a great example of the possibility of students that we see around us, including you guys. Jesus reached out to us here a few weeks ago. It's taken some time to get this interview together, but we finally managed to do it late night after all of our kids had gone down. So what I want you guys to catch though is he's a native Spanish speaker who reached fluency before he even moved to the United States, which is really cool. So he has a lot of great wisdom to share as somebody who has been down the track, who's done it before and has a lot of great words to share with you guys. So we hope that you guys enjoy this video. We hope that you gain some great information and some tips for you on your journey, whether you are aiming to reach fluency or not. We hope that this is a treat for you. So Jesus, tell us a little bit about who you are. What are you working on? Just a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Jesus Flores. I'm 34 years old and I live in Michigan in the United States. I am an English as a second language teacher, although that is more of a side hustle for me right now. My main job is in an office in our county circuit court. I've had office jobs in my time here in the U.S., but I have not given up on teaching completely. I still have a desire to pursue that dream, and I believe I'm taking steps to make that happen. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And other than that, some other biographical information, my home country or my native country is Colombia in South America. I've been here in the U.S. for nine years, or it will be nine years in the summer. And I have a wife and four children. You you know the struggle with balancing and juggling life things. Yes, all too well. So for you, do you balance like learning language, even though you have a decent sized family, you have a full time job already, you have English language teaching as a side hustle. So how do you balance all that? I think I basically engage in a lot of trial and error. I try different schedules and different ways to fit things into that schedule. Now about the language learning, I do need to say that at least where I see myself right now, I am not actively trying to learn English the way that I guess most people envision that mm. task. I would mm. say that I'm at a point in my life where I'm primarily focused on teaching, but at the same time, I'm trying to also conserve what's taken me all these years to acquire. So yeah. think of it as a conservation phase in my journey. It does make that a little bit easier because I'm not concerned about carving time out of the day to specifically do something that would be yeah. language learning related. I'm in what you could call a very passive stage or learning mode. Right. I'm not really concerned about output. Mm -hmm. It's more about basically conserving what I have acquired and, well, just trying to continue with my teaching career. The teaching really only occurs at least Monday through Friday at nighttime, really late. So it's kind of a sacrifice that I've had to make because I could easily just now be in bed. As I alluded to earlier, I don't want to give up on this dream just yet. And that teaching is a way to conserve and continue solidifying what you have, right? The teaching is one of yes. the best ways to learn and to conserve, for sure. Yes, exactly. There, there are many things that at this point have crystallized in my learning journey teaching slash learning journey. So besides teaching, what is another one or two ideas that you have been practicing to kind of help you conserve the English that you've already acquired? Listening to podcasts is one thing, I guess, in the most passive way that you can think of. I'm just right. basically consuming it and having it as sort of a background noise, because I will say this, even though I live in America and I've been here mm -hmm. for so many years, I happen to live in a place where I can be in relative isolation from other people. Mm -hmm. And our circle of friends is very small, yes. as in ridiculously small. And so it's not like I'm constantly in touch with people outside of my family circle mm -hmm. that I'm interacting with on, on a daily basis. So yes. a lot of the input that I'm just receiving as a way to keep this knowledge fresh in my mind is coming largely from podcasts, which is an interesting thing because you would think that just being here would kind of like allow you to you know, learn by osmosis. That's not really yeah. the case. That's been one of the big realizations in my 
time here in the U.S. I think that's what sneaks up on a lot of people that end up moving here for a career or they live here for a language immersion, but they find, oh, you don't actually have to speak most of the time. Yeah, You can hide and watch Netflix and do whatever you need to do at home and not talk at all to a real human being. And so it's really easy to do that if you're not pushing yourself. And like our personal experience living as foreigners in Asia, like that was the same thing. It was very easy to kind of stick to like the expat corners, the expat yes. centers, so that you don't have to have a lot of interaction with native speakers. So it was really hard for like a native speaker to really break into circles, even though, like you said, theoretically, they're all around you. But practically, it's really hard to find like that time, especially with a busy schedule and kids. Relative to nine years ago, where was your English nine years ago? Because this is before kids, right? So where were you language wise? And how has that evolved as you've added kids and family into the fray? And that's a great question. I'm going to say that I am not that far from where I was when I first moved to the US. I think whatever you can consider my level now, mm -hmm. it is not really significantly different from way back then when I mm -hmm. first came here to live in this country. So there's not really a whole lot to say there. Mm -hmm. I had already been working, for instance, on my American accent for years before I came here. I guess what has changed is that, as I said earlier, some things have crystallized in my mind and they are rock solid. So mm -hmm. there's no way that I'm going to lose some of those things. Mm -hmm. And with my children, I guess with my children, the thing that is now added into the picture is that my children are native speakers of English because right. they, they've all been born here. Right. Uh, and so I guess you could say that there's that language contact from them, right. but that's not the way that I see my kids as sources of input or anything, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. But certainly that is a fact of my family life. My wife and my children are native English speakers. Sure. And if anything, this is a point that I've not really made in my other interviews on YouTube. There were many reasons why I decided more than a decade ago to take on a pronunciation journey. But now that I have children who are native English speakers, mm -hmm. I also see my having acquired this accent as a way to also be for them a model to imitate, not as language learners, but I guess just simply as a parent that passes on a language to their children. I still remember to the day when we were living abroad and perhaps some of the most brutal language teachers were children because they oh, yeah. will correct you on the spot. But it's funny because for us, we were trying to obviously pass that on to a lot of the kids that we were teaching, but they were also ironically in a strange twist. They were some of the best teachers because they were really brutal with the pronunciation mistakes we would make or really brutal with the grammar mistakes. Like, no, you don't say it like that. That's really wrong. It's like this. And I kind of see that like even for our own children, like mm -hmm. how are we going to do that with them? Like certainly they acquire language pretty quickly. Right. But something that I think has been fascinating me recently is that the kids can acquire language and they absorb language, but they also can lose language a lot faster. Have you kind of seen that in your history as a language teacher? Not that I can think of right now, but my guess is that most people will experience something like that if they stop putting in that time and effort investment in their learning. Maybe I can reference something that did happen to me some time ago now. There was a point, maybe back in 2020, where some changes in our family dynamic made me start to fear that I was losing something that I had worked really hard to acquire. This gets into some really personal things that I'm not really going to share here out, you know, on the interwebs. But my wife speaks really good Spanish by my estimation. Mm -hmm. And so we have been basically in a bilingual relationship for as long as we've known one another. But some time ago now, all those years ago, I'm just going to say that there was less of a, I guess, equal exchange of languages there. And right. so I thought that I needed to take some steps to try to nip that in the bud, so to speak, yeah. because I really felt that I was losing some of my fluency back then. And so I went ahead and tried for a while, which is really ironic. I went ahead and I purchased a subscription for three months on Cambly. People uh -huh. don't know what Cambly is, which is which is the height of irony because I'm a tutor there now. 
I've been there as a user of the product. Yeah. I think it has a lot going for it. I really do. Yes. I can gripe about a lot of things there, but that's not here or there today. I can say that that was a personal experience of mine where something was just like backsliding in a way. And I took a very concrete step to try to like stop that from getting any worse. So what did you do with the tutor that you chose or signed up with? Like, what did you say? Like, I want to work on this. Or did you say, I feel like I'm slipping and I'm beyond functional fluency, but something is slipping. Like, were you able to put a finger on it and help your tutor? Or was your tutor able to say, this is, I, I see what's going on. This is what it is. Not as far as I'm able to remember at this point. I'm going to say that basically it just simply boiled down to being in situations where I would just have to speak a lot and right. then just try to recover some of that lost mm -hmm. language ability. Yeah, yeah, being put in the hot seat and having to use the language quite often. Something like that, yes. Because you see, even in my daily life, a lot of my interactions, for instance, with my coworkers who are all native English speakers, right. it's very transactional language. There's very oh, yeah. little substance to it. That will not sustain you in the long run. What would you say is an area, like you just referenced, transactional kind of language, what is a kind of communication uh, setting, if you will, that's been kind of more difficult or more advanced for you to find? So for example, I've heard from other language learners that, for example, spiritual vocabulary or spiritual instances, mm -hmm. spiritual discussions, can get really difficult. Like I know how to do business or I know how to be a teacher, but like when I get into these other contexts, I find that that's surprisingly more difficult. What context do you have in your history have you found to be more difficult? I was thinking about that one that you just mentioned, aspects about your religion, if you have any. Well, that one can be, I guess, a lot of things. Yeah. Um, certainly, I guess, in a country such as this one, yeah. where you basically, you run the gamut of no particular religion to being very firm in, in your beliefs. I think it's two things. And one is not just about the language. One aspect there that I would argue is that we don't really, I'm going to say, do enough introspection when it comes mm -hmm. to why we believe what we believe. And we don't really think critically about those things unless we were to be challenged in those things. Mm -hmm. And you know, then the language kind of also goes hand in hand there. It's not a conversation that I have frequently. Right. I will say that. And I guess most people are not going to be quite receptive to it unless they were your core religionist, for instance. That's a little bit different. That's more mm -hmm. like preaching to the choir. But mm -hmm. I guess as a way to have more in-depth conversations, at least here, my own gut feeling is that it's a topic that most people steer clear of, whatever the reasons uh, may be. It depends on Indeed. the part of the because I've had very in-depth uh, conversations with people with no religion or people of other religions just fine. It's been a no problem. But again, it really depends on where you are. The American South, you can have those conversations a lot more openly than in the North, for example. That would be a little bit trickier out there, out West, much more tricky there. Yeah, and even in so certain too. groups inside of it, right, where yeah. you may be in a more open group, like your circle, your circle of friends, your circle of influence may be just yeah. framed in such a way that, like you just said, like it's more reinforcement rather than like debate yeah. oriented. So sure. my own experience has been that most people shy away from confrontational interactions. It really turns a lot of people off. And this is interesting. I love having these conversations specifically about spiritual things because it is difficult mm -hmm. and it pushes people to the edge of their language ability. Right. And it causes a lot of introspection. And but having that conversation and wrestling with that in your language, it forces you to put words to things that are very abstract, just extremely abstract things that maybe even you try to shy away from normally in your own culture. Right. Very good way to like really push to the end and be prepared for those people that do come up and they will ask. Right. Because some places are worried about confrontation. Some places don't view it as confrontation at all. It's pure curiosity. So part of it, too, is gauging what's the intention of the person asking you yeah, as well. Absolutely. Great way to push to the limits of beyond functional fluency. One of the questions I wanted to ask you specifically, because this is where so many of our students are, so many people on our YouTube channel are at, they are advanced learners using intermediate strategies to try to grow in the advanced levels. We talk a lot about shifting from intermediate to advanced learning strategies in order to just be able to grow because it's like you hem yourself in quite a bit uh, when mm -hmm. you use intermediate strategies. It's been years ago for you now, I'm sure. Can you try to name some of those in your own personal journey with language and what, how you identified what you were doing, how you figured out finally that something wasn't working and how you shifted in order to be able to grow in the advanced 
And the same for advanced to fluent. If you want to make it more linear, that's okay. One thing that I would say is that I had plenty of opportunities back where I came from mm -hmm. to interact with native speakers face to face. I'm going to say that that was a pivotal moment for me. And I sought these opportunities out. I made very concerted efforts mm -hmm. to do this. And I was very fortunate to live in a place where, for instance, we had lots of Peace Corps volunteers. Some of them started a conversation club. I was involved in managing and running that. And so yeah. I took a very active role there. Now, I will say this, that was primarily for me a way to test out all of this pronunciation things that I have been working on because right. I took lots of accent training courses here and there. And I went to these things primarily with the intention of testing this out just to see if what I was learning was legit and if yes. they could understand me without any difficulty. And I think it worked. Other than that, probably I could add that one thing that worked wonderfully for me mm -hmm. was that I got really into anime many years ago and I was mm -hmm. listening to the English language dubs of these shows. I collected lots of vocabulary in these shows and I really mind those things. I really try my best to squeeze them dry of language. Mm -hmm. I recorded those things. I wrote them down. I had some example sentences written down as well. And for mm -hmm. a little while, and this is something that I would actually now strongly recommend some people do, is that I sat down in front of a camera and I mm -hmm. went through these things. I recorded them, reading them out loud as a way right. to have a record of it. And also as a way to, I guess, have that little bit of a read out loud practice, which you can have, I guess, your opinions on how, how useful do you think that is, but it was to me. Mm -hmm. And so I guess take those two examples for what they're worth. That's a good strategy in terms of what speakers do. Orators do this. They are supposed to film themselves giving a speech, or they're supposed to film themselves speaking, even in their native language. And then they go back and they look at it and they break down themselves. How well did they do? How did they structure that? Where were they enunciating well? Where were they getting lazy? This is a very common speaker thing to do. And we actually encourage doing that same thing in English as well, especially in the intermediate levels where you're still trying to figure out a lot. Once you get up into the advanced levels, I mean, it's helpful for tricky grammar and things like that, that you're not sure, like just to sit down in front of a camera and in front of your phone and just talk about something, something difficult that you've been wrestling with. How should I say this? And then watch it back and then you can correct yourself and do it better the next time, right? It's super helpful to do that. Super incredibly helpful. Yeah, for me, I was thinking of like our own language journey in Asia, and we were highly encouraged to record our own voices. And I absolutely hated it. I hated <laughs> yes. listening to my own voice in a foreign language. But there's only one way to get through it, which is to get comfortable actually producing the language out of your mouth, not just learning yeah. the knowledge. And I think that's a good strategy. I think yeah. just that regular practice of getting it out makes it to where when you're actually in that setting, and you're actually having a conversation with that person, you're not thinking about how to produce it. You're thinking about more what to say, which I think is really solid. Yeah, you'll be more focused on the content, yeah. not right. so much your, let's say your delivery right. of it. You're not searching for language. You're searching for ideas yeah. to continue the conversation along. Absolutely. Let me, I guess, add one more thing. You just tr trigger this in my mind just now. I've had the good fortune, I guess, of having some of my students on Cambly share some of the recordings of my lessons there uh, mm. with me. And yes. I've listened to some of these things primarily as a way to, as a teacher, evaluate my own teaching and yes. just see what bad habits I can get rid of or how I can better explain something or introduce something. And also how much of the talking I'm doing as opposed to the student. Yeah. That's something that language teachers struggle with. How do you keep your teacher talk time down and yeah. give the learner a chance to basically be in the driver's seat? It's hard. Now, luckily for me, I'm going to say this. It took me a while to get over that cringiness of listening to my own voice, but I'm pretty comfortable there now. And so I'm glad that that's not an issue for me anymore. Now it's just more about refining my teaching technique. What for you was like a benchmark when you knew like, not like I've arrived, but like you said, like right now my main focus is on conservation rather than like full development. So like, what was that moment that you're like, I did something and I did a thing like before I couldn't do the thing and now I can do the thing. Is there anything like that for you? I'm sure there's been a series or a number of like milestones like that. Now related to my conservation phase, I'm not really sure. I think it's just simply being 
a lot of small things that basically have that cumulative uh, you know, effect to them. But I guess just looking back farther into the past, one very clear moment for me when I knew that I crossed a threshold was yeah. when I was able to watch a segment of a newscast in English. It used to be a thing back where I used to live in Colombia that mm -hmm. some of the TV providers would have a handful of international TV channels. One of these was CNN. Mm -hmm. And I remember that I went from just being completely lost, trying yeah. to listen to what the news anchor was saying, to being fully able to follow yeah. an entire segment, like five or six minutes, whatever it is that they, that they do these days. Yeah. I'm going to say that our attention spans are getting shorter and we seem oh, to rely on sound bites all the time. Yeah. That's for another time, I guess. But for me, that was a big breakthrough. That's I went great. from being totally lost to following every word that the reporter was saying. So that was amazing. One of the questions I have for you as well is up in these upper levels, when you hit a plateau, what do you do? Like you said, you mentioned that time in 2020 where you felt you were slipping. That's kind of like different than a plateau, right? It doesn't feel like you're not it's, going anywhere. Yeah. It feels like you're going backwards. How do you know when you're on a plateau in those higher levels and what do you do to get off of it? That is really tough. I'm going to say that you would have to get really granular about something like this because I'm thinking, I guess, of the analogy of a hair's breadth. It's so fine yeah. that for most people, it goes mm -hmm. unnoticed. I'm yeah. not really sure, to be honest with you. I will say probably... Just to offer an example here, the one skill in the traditional sub skills of language that has lagged behind for me has been writing in general. I think I have some pretty decent writing skills, but I've not been in situations where a, let's say, a sound knowledge of writing skills has been required of me or needed. I've never been in that situation, not to date. Yeah. That might change. And if it does come to that point, I think in my mind, I have a very clear idea of what to do. And that is basically to seek out a tutor, someone yeah. who is highly specialized uh, mm -hmm. in that area of language production and just take a course. Because right. I think there's only so much that you can accomplish on your own. And I admit that even as a teacher. So yeah. that's one area where I would definitely just seek out some external aid. I would not rely on myself to do that if my circumstances were to demand that of me. Writing is particularly one of those where it's it's better to have a reader, <laughs> not just to write something, but to have an actual person to kind of give some feedback on it. It's a lot like the other mm -hmm. productive language skill being speaking. Like you can practice speaking as doing speeches and listening and reading aloud and stuff like that. But having that communication, having that two-way street is necessary. And I would say also that writing requires more of a laser focus approach. When we speak, we're used to being kind of vague and our language can be, let's just say that there's a lot of leeway and mm -hmm. there's a lot of negotiating that goes on between the parties. And so that's a different dynamic. But when it comes to a piece of written language, there's something there that's missing. That just simply requires, in my opinion, an expert, someone who is magnificently skilled in that regard. And that, I can say in all honesty, that's not me. So I would <laughs> seek out that help. It's the difference between communication and crafting, right? There's there's a difference there. I mean, you're totally right. When we teach anything like writing, we do it completely differently than we do with speaking. They're both producing skills, but you can't teach them the same way. There's a lot of predicting what your audience is thinking like, right? You have to predict how they're going to take certain things. So something that you might say because it makes sense as a family joke or it makes sense from your background, you've got to be cognizant of where they are coming from. I love writing. So for me personally, this is my wheelhouse, I guess, is in the writing realm. But that's one of those things you're right with speaking. It's completely different cross-culturally, especially when you're trying to operate, you're trying to read body language, pick up paralanguage, you're doing all of this back and forth. And it's very forgiving. You can make mistakes. With writing, not so much. You yes. actually have more information right yes. when you're speaking even though so there's fewer more. words compared to like a written text mm -hmm. you actually have a lot more cues to like understand i remember like all of my students in asia would be doing like bbc english right bbc news english yeah. and it was the same thing like for them it was really helpful because they had a lot of the other context of the language and then when they were just having just a written text just an article and that was all they had. And the basically the discussion questions were reading between the lines. And it was yes. really hard for them, even though it was right there. You and I have the same sheet of paper, but 
you don't have as many cues to kind of help you out. Like if a person perhaps reads aloud and kind of gives you some of those cues with their intonation, with how they're speaking it, that can kind of help. You may know this, but my favorite subject is actually math, not English at all, actually. <laughs> for your language development, for your language skills, mm -hmm. specifically if you could map your study time on like a plot map or like a Gosh. chart map, a bell curve or whatever you want to call it. How would you say the study time specifically would go from your journey from beginner to where you are now? Like, would it be kind of like up and down, like I've spent a lot, or would it be kind of more like a logarithmic? Is that what that right? Is it going down or exponential and stuff like that? How would you map that in your mm -hmm. mind? I'm going to say probably you would have an exponential growth initially, or at least through, let's say, the intermediate levels, which mm -hmm. is so fuzzy. I don't really know what that means anymore, to be quite frank. But typically, I think what happens is that you make a lot of progress through the beginner levels. And then typically, there's going to be that dreaded intermediate plateau that a lot of people hit and get stuck at. And then perhaps the study time, just trying to think back to my own experience, the study time really begins to, I'm going to say first stabilize, and then gradually dip mm -hmm. lower and lower. And probably what's going to happen is that there will be different times when dip all the way, let's say, down to a minimum. And it might experience some fluctuation, but it will never probably go back to the peak of what happened at the beginning. Yeah. At least that's been my experience to this day. I can say for sure that way back, I spent a lot more time and effort and I went through much more trouble than now to pick up as much as I could, try to basically learn the language. And yeah. now whatever effort I put in compared to those times, it's going to appear minimal. Yeah. There's going to be a wide discrepancy, significant discrepancy in the amount of effort and time that I'm putting in now, right. you know, just compared to 10, 15 years ago. People are going to ask, I know they would ask in the comments, how old were you when you started? Because some people are going to say, well, if you're two or three or you're six years old and you're going to an international school, of course, it's going to be more time then. Like, how old were you when you started? I like to give 14 as the age when this journey starts for me. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easier for me to, I guess, tell the story. Yes. And there's basically one reason why that is the case. So mm -hmm. as most people, I went through years of regular schooling. And there was a foreign language requirement. Now, mm -hmm. for the vast majority of schools in my native country of Colombia, that is English. Mm -hmm. Some notable exceptions include some schools that give you an option to go for French, but those are really outside the norm kind of uh, institutions. They are by no means representative of the vast majority of the population. When I was 14 years old, I went to an independent language school. That was in addition to my regular schooling. That was the first time in my life that I saw learning this language differently than from my regular school days. I had, to the best of my recollection, amazing teachers. They used English almost exclusively during class. And if you have had the experience of asking what it was like for other people in other countries, you're probably going to hear that your teachers are going to resort a lot to your first language, especially when you share that language with them. And so my experience was the same. But then this comes along. This is different. This, this gets me pumped to get into this. Some of these teachers had lived in the U.S. back in the 90s. I mean, this was 2004. And I was, I was mesmerized by what they could do and by basically their example. Yeah. It lit a fire under me, if I want to use that expression. Mm -hmm. And so that gets me started, I guess, on that uh, trajectory. I would say that that's where I really hit the peak of my effort and activity, study mm -hmm. time, whatever you want to call it. It really starts to soar at that point. I think a line graph, you would see it like shooting that time of maximum activity uh, for yeah. me or in case. And then when I was 18, I'm going to say it started to stabilize, mm -hmm. but I, I think it was still a pretty intense period of activity because when I was 18, I took one of these uh, international proficiency exams and I had spent about a year and a half before that preparing for the test. That was also the most in-depth study, let's say, that I had done uh, up until that point. But then after that, after I take this test and I pass and I get my certification, it definitely starts on a 
downward uh, trajectory. There's a trend uh, there. So it will probably never get to that peak again, at least not for the foreseeable future. So I guess you can say that it started when I was 14. I guess that there had been some preparation prior to that, but nothing really that stands out in yeah. what I'm able to recall at this point. Some of the details are fuzzy. I mean, that was a long time ago. You've had kids since then, so. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, and indeed. And the most amazing definition that I've seen of this is that that reduction of memories to the lowest common denominator. Yeah. And that has happened to me. A lot of those details are just lost. They're lost to oblivion at this point. There's no way that I can get that back, I don't think. Yes. That's cool. I think here recently I've been reading an, a book mm -hmm. it's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I don't know if you read it. But part of it that I've been thinking about a lot with languages is like you said, like I kind of see that exponential like rise yeah. when you're in the beginner and intermediate stages. But likewise, I saw for me too, I see that the decrease after a person's reached a goal or they've gone too advanced. But part of me also wonders that the little bit of time, like you're saying, the podcast, just the retention, the conservation, just mm -hmm. a little bit of time that you spend when you're in advanced like, yes, it, while you may not like uncover like a new grammatical pattern that you didn't know existed before, what's good about that is that you still are learning because of all the growth, like you're building on a house, right? If you're trying to hang a picture on a wall, you needed that wall to be there in the first place. And so is it the decorations that make the room? Um, probably not. You need a room to have to be there, but yeah. I definitely see the advantage of like the conservation and like the slow growth of an advanced learner, especially when compared to like the skyrocketing growth from like a beginner and intermediate, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. And native speakers do this too. Like, it's not that we stop learning words, right? There's 170,000 words to learn in this language. And we'll only get to a maximum of probably knowing upwards of 60,000 if we're active writers or we have professions or which is widely read, for example. But you keep learning. The more you read, the more you interact, the more you learn. So you're learning like we do in a sense, by putting yourself to where you've got ears in other places. And so Absolutely. different contexts. The learning never stops. I would just say that the mode of learning changes. Absolutely. Yes. So I have one more question for you. And this might be a quick answer. It might not be. I don't know. Do you foresee yourself learning another language to this degree in the future? The short answer is no, unless <laughs> things were to drastically change in my yeah. life. As best as I can discern and plan things for the future. I don't see myself doing this with any other language. I've had fleeting interests, kind of like flirting with other languages here and there, but nothing has ever come close to mm. my life forming experience with this language. I will say something like this to you, and this is going to sound really interesting or maybe strange. When I look at my two languages side by side, I feel that my communicative competence in English far outdoes my communicative yes. competence in my own language. Yes. One of the reasons is that I feel that I have a much more expansive vocabulary in English than in Spanish. And also, I would say that my thought processes, if I can use this word, I guess, are more sophisticated or complex, uh, given where I am now and my life experiences to this day. There might come a time when another language will, let's say, present itself. Mm -hmm. I don't really think so. I'm not actively seeking those opportunities. I don't know. My short answer is no, but nobody can predict the future. At right. least let's just say that there's always that contingency there, that something could definitely come to pass. Yeah. And it might just get me started on a different journey. But at this point, uh, wh where I am, I just don't see that happening. I don't see it in the cards, so to speak. Yeah. These things really change a lot. And it's an ever evolving uh, situation. Like mm -hmm. maybe I will find myself doing that. One thing that might change that is that as my children get older, I believe that they will show more of an interest in picking up Spanish. They're not there yet. The one that seems the most open to the idea is my daughter. She's mm -hmm. definitely shown more of an interest than her brothers. For instance, my daughter is turning five in, in July. Right. And it is certainly not there. There's no real interest that I can discern at this point. But when right. that changes, mm -hmm. I will have to get my act together yes. with Spanish. I know that that will happen eventually because they're also going to be interested in connecting with my family that's still there, that does mm -hmm. not speak English. That may motivate them to do that, to pursue yes. that. 
Absolutely. There's nothing like it. And so for them, especially, it's a great and healthy thing to do that, of course, not to mention super useful to be bilingual. So yeah. they can get to that point, like as you have, like that would be an amazing asset to go into adult life with. I think about like people that learn American Sign Language and a lot of them don't initially inspire to do so, but kind of like you're saying, like life circumstances and communication mm -hmm. with people in their family kind of dictates that it needs to be there. Like you're not necessarily like looking for the opportunities to perform or to communicate in American Sign Language. But then when somebody in the family, maybe they start to lose some communication abilities, then that starts to naturally pick up that yeah. environment kind of dictates the communication skills that need to be there, which I think is really cool. So like you said, can't predict the future, but that's kind of an exciting possibility in the future for you. Absolutely. That's going to be really interesting the day that happens, because I'm firmly convinced that when that happens, it will be unmistakably clear. They really want to learn my language or my other language now. It'll be the time. That'll be the call to action when yeah. that happens. Yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So where can people find you if they want to work with you? We have, of course, lots of Spanish speakers that watch the channel too. Some of them may be interested. Um, although if I'm hearing you correctly, you're not going to use Spanish, right? You're going to force them to use English to figure things out. I'm going to say yes to that. But also my own stance on using your shared language as scaffolding in language learning has actually shifted. You could say that I have softened my stance there. I have no problem anymore with a sprinkling of your first language mm. uh, used as support, scaffolding. I have no issue with that anymore. I am more than open to using that as, think of it as training wheels. People can find me right now, at least, primarily on Cambly and secondarily on Preply. My application on Preply was just approved last week. I'm still building up the thing and I guess we'll see where that goes. Really? I'm one among 20 plus thousand English tutors. So yeah. it's going to take some creativity for me to stand out. But they can look me up there on Preply. If you want to find me there, you'll find me as uh, Jesus Florence. Mm -hmm. If you want to find me on Cambly, my display name there is Sound American with me. There you go. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for meeting with us today, Jesus. That was amazing to hear from your perspective from the other side, from English. We know it from the Asian side of things and learning Mandarin, but to hear it from somebody actually wrestling with this language in particular, it's always a treat for us to hear. And for you taking your time out of your day, like you said, it's an evening thing. It's a late night thing. And we, we get that. And so we're really, really thankful that you took your time out of the day just to meet with us, to let us pick your brain a little bit, because it's as language teachers to a language teacher, it's always yeah. fascinating. Yes, it's very enriching conversation. I also wish to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me this opportunity. I took some back and forth to plan this, but I'm glad that we were able to do it. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. Jesus, thanks for meeting with us. If you have any links or anything like that so that people could find you, just share them with us and so we can put them in the link below. Um, Absolutely. And yeah, I'll be, so I'll be sending you that tomorrow. Perfect. Sweet. All right. All right. Have thank a good you. night, okay? All right. Thank you. You guys as well. All right, guys. So there you go. So if you want to work with Jesus, like we said, look in the description below and we'll put some of his links in there so that you can work with him. But even if not, what we hope that you guys found on this video was a couple of things that just show the reality of what it takes to get to fluency and what it's like when you're there. Yeah. Let us know in the comments below if you want more videos like this. We do actually do quite a few interviews on a semi-regular basis with people that have kind of been in the game for a long time. If that's something that you want to see more, pop a comment below and let us know. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll catch you in the next one. Bye.